Good afternoon. Welcome to the latest edition of Civics Forward. The future, especially the future of our political and economic system, is a key part of our work at the Chamber Foundation. Over the years, many words have been written about the decline of civic knowledge and civic skills in this country. All are well-meaning, but few seem to have gained traction. That's not the case with a clear-eyed, optimistic piece that David Davenport, our guest today, recently wrote for the Hatch Foundation. I can't tell you how many people sent copies of this paper to me, even before it was published. And they described it as a must read for anyone who is concerned about the state of civic knowledge and civic skills in America and way, in thinking about ways to elevate civics and strengthen our democracy. So we're delighted that David has agreed to participate in today's episode of Civics Forward, especially since he's going to be joined in conversation by another valued Chamber Foundation partner, a leading light in the fields of education, civics, and philanthropy in her own right. So Hannah Scandera was recently appointed CEO of the Daniels Fund. Uh, it's the latest in a series of prominent positions, including a long stint as Secretary of Education in New Mexico. That alone qualifies her to drive today's conversation. But there's another piece of the puzzle. Almost 20 years ago, Hannah and David co-authored a paper on, on the development of civic associations in this country and the ways they can support democratic self-government. That's really what all of our work in civics is about. So we're honored to have these distinguished guests for today's program. They've been thinking about this for a very long time and are sure to bring some really valuable insights to the topic. So I'll turn it over to Hannah for now. I'll be back later to organize a little Q&A session. If you have any questions, just throw them into the chat. Hannah, it's all yours. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Mike. It is great to be here and thrilled to be a part of this conversation uh, in joining and partnering with the foundation, U.S. Chamber Foundation and Civics Forward event. And I, I just will say, um, not only have I had the privilege of working with David Davenport, but he is a friend and mentor as well. And he, just to give a little more color, he is a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, a senior fellow at the Ashbrook Institute, and as Mike mentioned, um, recent author of the what's become affectionately known as the Hatch Report, um, that is really a buzz around um, the, the bigger buzz, if you will, of civics in and across our country, and particularly in the education space, and the importance of it, and where are we going, and what's possible. And so, David, welcome. Thank you, Hannah. Good to be with you. Great. Well, I just want to say, as the presidency of the Daniels Fund, we have four strategic pillars, one of them being developing contributing citizens. We've we have made a priority of investing in everything from teacher training to local, local civics organizations, and most recently excited about our partnership with the U.S. Chamber Foundation in launching a civics beat across our country. So stay tuned on that. We are very excited about it and um, excited about this conversation today. And I guess, David, I would just say, as you think about our conversation today, I, I, I really believe that the civics education has been reinvigorated. Uh, and, and for some, I think in a fearful way, because we think about our country and it feels divided. And, um, and where do you weigh in and how do you be in the, in the midst of this? But I'm optimistic. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how you see things and what the landscape, the lay of the land, and where you lay, are you optimistic or pessimistic or somewhere in between? Uh, that's a big question, Hannah, and I'll, I'll take at least a couple pieces of, of it and, and you can follow up. Um, the, uh, I am hopeful that civics really has become, as you say, a major part of our national conversation. Um, unfortunately, as I put in my uh, so-called Hatch report, um, civics has kind of been elbowed out of the curriculum and out of the conversation in a lot of schools. And I, I think in a way it was, it was well-meaning. I don't think that this was any kind of plot to attack civics. But we got so focused on reading and math and preparing students for the standardized testing in those subjects. And then along came STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math education. And we put billions of dollars into STEM and all kinds of heavy emphasis. 
So what's happened, I think, is that these new emphases on reading and math and testing and STEM education have just sort of elbowed civics out of the curriculum. Um, whereas in, say, the 1960s, a, a student would have had several courses in aspects of civics. Now they basically, if they're in the right state, they have one, one semester course on civics, and, and it's just not enough. So there's a lot of good conversation now about how we can revive civics. There's also, I think, some dangerous conversation right now in which civics has started to become highly politicized, which again is probably not surprising in our politicized and divided world, but I think that's frankly going to be a problem long term. Yeah, well said. I think about um, the common uh, conversation in public policy about unintended consequences. And I think you you referred to that when you talked about, right, no, no ill will, but somewhere between reading math and STEM and other priorities, we might have lost something really important. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, in your, in your uh, Hatch report, one of my favorite quotes is, how can you trust what you don't understand? Tell me what you found in your research about the downstream impact uh, this, uh, this crisis, and I'll, I am going to use the word crisis, in civics has had on our democracy. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's the, uh, the one of the important points that I developed in the report is that a lot of our civic problems, which people are increasingly recognizing, could be addressed by better civic education. So, for example, we see a huge loss in trust, especially among young people. Trust in institutions, including government, trust in leaders, business, government, media, beyond. Um, and a lot of that is because they don't understand. And, and as you say, how can you, how can you trust what you don't understand? So a better understanding of civics is demonstrated to lead to greater trust. Um, we also have voting turnout problems, especially among the young. Uh, the 2020 election was a bit of an exception. Uh, and, and I hope frankly is the beginning of a long-term uh, trend toward more voting, but I sort of doubt it. Um, and, and again, more voting, more turnout, more civic responsibility is going to be helped by better civic education. Um, we see a lot of the debates in policy today. Again, you know, you see young people, for example, saying we would like to have socialism. Well, when you get to the bottom of that, they don't really understand what socialism is. And, and there, there's some things they do want, but it's really not socialism. So lack of civic knowledge leads to a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of skewed debates. So a, a number of the problems that we're experiencing in our democracy could be greatly helped by better civic education. Terrific. I mentioned uh, earlier that uh, the Daniels Fund is uh, doubling down on, on their commitment because of Bill Daniels' commitment to preparing and developing contributing citizens, whether that's through scholarship or through education at the K-12 level. Um, as you think about um, a better civics education. What does that mean? What, what, what? Uh, cast a vision, and what, you know, we're here with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation, and uh, obviously business leaders across the country, and right. thinking about this. What does this a better civics education look like? What are the, what are the layers of this cake, if you will? Well, uh, you've borrowed a term from our report, as you probably well know. My father was a baker, and so I, I use this, this term, uh, layer cake. Um, we, we, we need to have civic education begin in the elementary grades. Uh, we essentially have now no civic education taking place in the elementary grades and almost none in middle school. And as I said, you, you kind of wait till your junior or senior year and you have a single one semester course. Well, it's kind of too late by then. You, you know, the, the students don't have a vocabulary. They don't have a core understanding of the concepts to really appreciate and benefit from that one course. So the first thing we need to do, I think, is start building the layer cake in elementary school and giving kids what they can learn. And there's quite a bit they can learn in elementary school. Certainly I did in, in my schooling in Kansas in the 50s and 60s. We had lots of learning about civics and about history that were very helpful. Uh, and then we continue to add things that are great appropriate. So by the time they get to high school, uh, they have a good grounding for taking their civics course. And then in high school, I think we actually need a full year of civics and not just a single semester. And we need more states to require, we still have some states that don't even require the teaching of civics. We need that to be across the board and we need to move toward a full year course and not just a half a year. And another improvement that I would make is, I think we've gotten a little off track 
and failing to appreciate civic knowledge. Um, we are moving in a lot of areas, including reading. Uh, we, we teach reading these days, as E.D. Hirsch and others have pointed out, as just a set of skills. And, and we've gotten away from reading literature for its own sake and history for its own sake uh, and, and for better knowledge and understanding. So we need to be sure that we're not just teaching civic skills or you know, how does government work? What buttons do you push to get things done? But we need to have some, be teaching a deeper understanding and deeper civic knowledge, if you will. Uh, so that would be another improvement. Um, by the end of our report, I do recommend two big things. One is we need our state legislatures to require more civics, uh, to require that it be taught at, in some way in elementary and, and uh, middle schools and that we have a full year course in high school and perhaps even a civics test. And then we need to do a much better job of teacher training for civics. Those are the big two uh, recommendations that I make. Terrific. Um, obviously, your answer is near and dear to my heart because education is uh, uh, a space that I've spent a lot of time in. And so what I hear you saying in that is start earlier, lay a foundation, then start layering that cake. Um, and, but also um, thinking about um, I, I hear in that there's a there's a role for advocacy, if you will, whether it's the business community, parents and communities asking for these things so that there's there's a, a clear, quantifiable demand to begin to create um, the energy and importance around this, whether that's in our legislature and then um, into our states and school districts. Um, I, I do think the voice um, uh, in this space is really important. But let me push on one thing. Obviously, I, I said earlier, love the focus on what I would call K-12 education and re, re, doubling down on the on the priority. Love the focus on the teacher training. That's something we're committed to here at the Daniels Fund. What about, and I mentioned earlier our excitement about a partnership with the U.S. Chamber a Foundation in regards to launching a civics fee. Um, I mentioned earlier we, we invest in a lot of local, what I'll call civics or organizations. What is the role of kind of uh, the society and communities today in and thinking through this conversation about um, how important civics is and how do we bring it back to life in a way that's meaningful, that has the knowledge, and we'll get to this next, so I'm, I'm giving you a, a knowledge that leads to action versus action that might be uninformed. Right. So, talk well, about I, I, you know, I think you put your finger on a, a, a subtle but really important point, which is what we perhaps most need is a national priority uh, toward civics. There have been at least two or three times in, in our history, uh, in, at least in my day, we, we had the Sputnik uh, episode in the 1950s when Russia launched uh, into space ahead of the U.S. And, and we, we suddenly became aware that we needed to do a lot more in science and technology education in this country. It led to a major national movement. We had a, a report in the early 80s, a, a nation at risk that again led to a lot of conversations and a lot of actions at many levels across the country. We, and, and, and STEM is the latest big national push. We need that kind of national push and national conversation really at all levels about civics. Uh, this is not a problem that's gonna be solved in Washington. This is not a problem that's gonna be solved by a, a billionaire uh, investing his for, or her fortune in this. This is gonna be solved by action at all levels. Uh, Ronald Reagan, in his final speech as president, said that we need to be teaching civics at the family dinner table. And that's certainly where it needs to begin. It's a, it's a family question. We need, as you say, community leaders um, working with their schools to train teachers and emphasize the priority of civics. Uh, your idea of a civics bee with the Chamber Foundation is, I think, brilliant. Uh, having done debate myself during school, I learned so much by participating actively in learning things in that way. So a civics bee, I think, is a great idea to draw more attention to the field and get kids excited about civics. Uh, and so we, we need action at all kinds of levels, the local level, business level, family level. Uh, that's the good news. That's the reason to be optimistic, I think, is that there are lots of ways that people can be involved in improving civics. That's great. I'm, I'm struck by so many times in the in the public policy uh, discourse, the question is, well, whose responsibility is it? Is it the state's role, the federal role, the local role? And what I say hear you saying is it's everyone's role because we're, we're Americans. And, and part of being an American is knowing what it means to be American and understanding 
not just intellectually, but also in, into the, the, the engagement piece. Um, how do we start, you know, whether it's at the local civics or even at the, the national conversation to see these things converge so that everyone has a role to play if we wanna see the crisis of civics uh, education in our country solved. Right. This is, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan, it, it'd be worth people going back and reading his farewell address. And this is kind of what he emphasized, that that we need to be uh, passing on to the next generation, not only knowledge and understanding, but love of country. And in my personal opinion, that's one of the ultimate goals of civic education is to empower kids to, to know and understand and love their country and make a contribution to it. And uh, so a national movement in that direction that involves families, nonprofits, churches, businesses, uh, legis state legislators, uh, uh, even in Washington. I mean, there's just lots of ways that we could really stir up a major national push along the lines of science and, and technology and reading that we've had for the last few decades. Terrific. I'm surprised. Um, and maybe, you know, sometimes we, we don't like to talk about these things, but at, at the top, of a, the beginning of the, our, our conversation and, and Mike brought this up, you know, the, there's some things that have become political that really ought to be just what it means to be American. And, right. and with the politicizing and the polarization, there's fear of engaging. And um, I think one of the opportunities we all have is to humbly enter this space and trying to tear down, the, down those barriers that um, shouldn't exist if we really want to see uh, right. this this opportunity emerge in a way that's meaningful, that everyone owns, not a single entity or, or as you said, a funder or, or a government space, but everyone owns. Um, and that's where the success will come. And the, the, the memory of our identity, if you will, as Americans is my, am, am I hearing you right on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a pragmatic uh, person. And so I'm much more interested in seeing us make progress uh, than I am in politicizing or winning some kind of debate in civics education. Unfortunately, um, every, you know, the, the writer Thomas Mann said, everything is politics. Well, that may well describe our day. And, and so civics and history have unfortunately also fallen into that uh, pit, if you will, of becoming political. Um, it's mostly, frankly, most of the politics is not about civics and government itself. It's mostly about American history and the founding. Um, and you know that's a debate that scholars probably should be having, um, but I'm not sure we need to put that on the backs of our students learning in the way that we're now doing. So you know we have the 1619 project saying, well, you know the founding really wasn't in 1776. It was when the first slaves arrived and we need to reorient our teaching of American history around that. And then we have the, the uh, argument about critical race theory and is the whole system uh, of America racist and, and do we need to teach it in that way? And then President Trump has his 70, 1776 commission and no, we need to reemphasize that. I mean, that's, as I said, that's a debate for scholars to have, but I think it's, I, most kids are really not ready for or need to be heavily engaging those kinds of political issues. So that is my fear that Whereas there are lots of objective things we can do, I, I actually think we need more civics, more than we need a, a certain kind of civics. And so I think there's just a lot we could do to improve civics that doesn't drag our kids through all of that, that sort of debate. And, and as is often the case in these political debates, the two sides want to make it all or nothing. You know, you can't just have slavery part of the conversation. You have to reorient the whole teaching of, of the American founding based on slavery. You can't just have race in the conversation. You have to reorient to the whole system is racist. And so then you have people passing bills in state legislatures that all these things can't be taught at all. It's all or nothing. So even the debate that we're having about that in my view is not terribly useful, but in an era where everything is politics, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that, that politics has raised its head in this arena as well. Well, uh, thank you for that. Um, I've enjoyed this conversation. We're going to open it up for, for questions um, from our, our audience. I, I guess um, in summary, you've got a book. Uh, I know you're co-authoring a book that's coming out this next year. And my, my push to myself and all those who are here is how do we take the, the most simple opportunities to engage and advocate for 
um, our country, if you will, um, and its prosperity and with the uh, civics as a, an important part of our foundation. And so we'll look forward to seeing your book out. We appreciate um, your, your, um, your insight into this space. And we'll turn it back over to Mike for audience Q&A. Thanks, Hannah. I could have listened to you two talk about this all day, learning a lot just through that conversation. Um, so please, if you have questions, uh, put them into the chat. I'll get us kicked off. You know, uh, one of the things that that both David, you and, and both of you actually talked about was civics in the context of, of K through 12 and, and, and schools. Um, but because of the chronic under under prioritization or deprioritization of civics for generations, we have a multi-generational deficit. Do you have any ideas or suggestions as to how we as a society can tackle that, even going beyond the traditional school system? Hannah, maybe I'll start with you and then. Well, um, I, I do think uh, education is is a, a, a foundation and a great starting point for sure, as I, as I mentioned earlier. And and I mentioned the Daniels Fund and, and their excitement about thinking about teacher training. David mentioned that as well and this civics be and and how do we engage we have we have a part to play as a foundation we're not going to solve this problem um but we we are giving our best shot at how do we participate in a meaningful way and one thing we see is uh you know a, uh, partnering with you all at the foundation to launch this civics be and ask that uh, create an opportunity if you will for us to come into our communities at the local level and encourage our young people to be a part and and learn um, as a foundation. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think what I know that, that at least a, a good number in our audience are, are going to be chamber members around the country. And, and, you know, many of those chambers, I think, could easily sponsor, you know, constitutional, the, the handing out of constitutions and declarations in schools, uh, the reading of those documents, as Hannah said, bees and contests and oratory and speech contests uh, about that. Uh, that gets students engaged. Uh, I'm very involved in um, teaching through primary documents, through the use of primary documents, and training our teachers in our schools to get our kids involved in reading the documents of the time that they're studying, the speeches, the space. And, and that's something that all generations can participate in. Um, and and uh, so there, there are just lots of ways, I think, to have community-wide conversations that draw lots of people in. And then you hear other people's perspectives, and that's very useful. So, David, the next question is for you. Uh, David makes a great point about teacher education. Could he elaborate and maybe discuss programs that effectively address that deficiency? Yes, I, I do think that's one of the biggest issues. Um, when I did my study, I hadn't realized the, the various dimensions of this. You know, first of all, you don't really major in civics in college. So your typical civics teacher may have had some courses in social studies, but didn't major in civics. It's really not a major uh, in, in college. And then when you go to uh, get your master's degree in teaching, which I think most teachers either have or aspire to, that's really about how to teach, not about the content of teaching. And so what we learn is that a lot of teachers in various subjects, but certainly in civics, they get to the classroom with very little preparation themselves and knowledge about the field. Um, I, I will mention two ways that I think are very effective at training teachers. One I was just starting in on, which is the teaching of primary documents, which the Ashbrook Center does, and I'm doing some work with them now, where they have students not, in a sense, take off their 21st century lenses and go back into history and read the debates and speeches and arguments of the time and really engage in those through the use of primary documents. And it, it's more objective. It gets us away from the problem of presentism, reinterpreting everything with our 21st century values. And it allows us to learn history in, in an exciting way at the time. I'm also impressed iCivics, which was started by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, has developed lots of games and tools that kind of engage students in, in the learning of civics. So there's a lot of good tools out there and we need to spend, I th again, I think, frankly, a lot of local community leaders could help sponsor teacher training, uh, which 
Unfortunately, because it's not happening enough in colleges and graduate schools, it has to happen once the teachers are already in te in service teaching. And so they can help by sponsoring programs by the Ashbrook Center, by iCivics, uh, uh, by several good organizations. So Hannah, I'm gonna build on that by, by bringing a question to you. We've, we've had conversations with civics teachers around the country, especially middle school teachers, because that's an area that we're particularly interested in through the Chamber Foundation. And one of the themes that emerged during those conversations, and it didn't matter whether it was a red state, a blue state, or you know, a, what, whatever the political disposition of the community was, was irrelevant. It was a consistent thread. And that was the teachers were nervous to say it lightly about bringing controversial subjects into the classroom. And one of the reasons they were nervous was the politicization or the polarization that we've been talking about. The other was that they were confident that their supervisors or the administrators would have their back if someone complained. So when we look at, like, is there anything that we can do to better empower teachers? Because we know that it's through those kind of conversations and through that kind of perception shift and the kids learn. What, what is it, do you have any ideas about that? A um, couple things come to mind as I think about this. Number one, and and uh, David said it earlier, and, and whether it's uh, uh, any number of folks like the Ashbrook Institute, the Bill of uh, Rights Institute, et cetera, going back to original documents allows you to get away from a narrative um, based on an individual's interpretation. I'm not saying there's a, not a place for that. I'm just saying as we think about engaging, um, I think getting a, a foundation that is not your interpretation of the moment, but creates the opportunity for a conversation um, in your classroom uh, gives you a, a, an, a, a foundation that is, I think, much um, so, more solid than, than starting with presentism, as, as David said, uh, going forward. But I, I don't want to be naive on this. I, I do think there's just a lot of um, consternation around um, this space right now. And, I think the the best and healthiest way to think about this is we all have a role to play. And so whether you're a school principal, a d district superintendent, a state chief in your in your state, or a community leader, that uh, um, asking and being a part and supporting the, the opportunity is a really important role to play. Otherwise, we're just that we'll keep running from the opportunity and for some, the feeling of the risk. Um, and never actually ground ourselves in the opportunity of this layering of the cake that David talked about. And, and so part of this is, uh, we're, I think, as, as individuals and communities, we have to acknowledge the importance of this and create a cry for that importance that then creates a safer opportunity, for lack of a better way of saying it, for our educators to actually teach and, and do what they do best instead of wondering as they walk in the door, you know, is... is um, you know, am I going to step on a landmine? Um, and that's a responsibility I think we all hold as citizens. So if we had more time, I would ask you, you know, what, what happens if we don't fix this? But I want to end on a really positive note. <laughs> when, when you look at the landscape of, of where we are today, when you look at where we are today and where you think we might be going tomorrow, what gives you the greatest amount of optimism about the future of civics in America? And maybe we'll start with you, David. And well, I think, um, actually, I, I think the fact that we now have people from both the left and the right engaged in the conversation is a reason to be optimistic. On one hand, it makes the conversations more challenging. But on the other hand, historically, people on the right, more conservative people have had more focus on civics. And I would say it's actually a very positive sign that also people on the left who are worried about our democracy have kind of entered the conversation in a new way. So to me, that's the sign of optimism. The second sign is the one I mentioned earlier, which is we don't need Washington or a billionaire to fix this. We can all be engaged in fixing it. So I can wake up tomorrow and do something about it. And I can be part of the improvement uh, that we need. And to me, that's a second reason for optimism. Anna? I'll double down on that really quickly and just say at the end of the day, the fact that this is a conversation in so many spaces and places is is a good thing. And um, if, if we're not talking about it and no and no one's talking about it, how do you get to it, so to speak? And how do you say what's the problem we're trying to solve and, and actually create 
a pathway to that. And then secondly, you know, on so many public policy and education issues, it's easy to relegate and say, well, that's not my issue. That's not my problem. Uh, and as David said, this is everyone's opportunity. It is all of our opportunities to, whether at the incredible grassroots level at the dinner table, in your home at night, whether it's in your classroom, whether it's in the opportunity to take your kids to a civics bee and participate and be prepared, um, whether it's in, in our districts and creating opportunities for our teachers to, to actually teach. Um, and I, I could go down the list. There's, there's no space and place or person, in my opinion, that this does not apply to and present an opportunity. And when I think about why I am uh, proud to be an American, it is because it, it, we are grounded and founded in each one of us having a responsibility. And here we are with that uh, responsibility and opportunity today. Well, I think I asked the right question at the end. Uh, that's a really good way for us to wrap up this conversation. Uh, many thanks to Hannah and to David for, for joining this episode of Civics Forward and to you in the audience for taking the time out of your busy day to join us on this, this kind of excursion into one of the most important issues that America faces. Uh, we hope you'll join us again for future episodes of Civics Forward. Uh, as you just heard, we can all be engaged in fixing this. So thank you for joining us. You can learn more about the U.S. Chamber Foundation and our work at uschamberfoundation.org. Uh, in the meantime, please have a great day, be well, and thank you again for joining us.